Sarah used 240 to pass her English content exam, and so can you. She wrote to us and said that the materials and quizzes helped get her past that pesky praxis. Hi, I'm Emma. I spent many years teaching students in classrooms, and now I work with 240 to help teachers pass their certification exams. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis English Language Arts Content Test. That's number 5038. This is a test for prospective secondary school English language arts teachers. This video is gonna cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the biggest concepts that you need to master, and after that, we're gonna look at a few practice questions. So who's ready to dot those I's and cross those T's? Let's get into it. Now this Praxis English language arts content knowledge exam consists of three content categories, reading, language use and vocabulary, and writing, speaking, and listening. The exam contains 130 selected response questions in all. Categories one and three are worth the biggest chunks at 38 and 37%. And we can't forget about category two. It's worth 25%, so we'll need to make sure we're ready for that one too. Let's tackle the categories in that order. We'll discuss key concepts you must know for your exam for categories one and three, and then we'll finish up with category two. In the reading category, you'll see questions about both literature and informational texts and rhetoric. This category covers a lot. You'll see questions about characteristics of different genres, questions about teaching reading in the secondary classroom, and questions based on passages. So you'll need to know about reading, know how to teach reading, and know how to read and analyze text all at the same time. Whoa. The good news is we have all of this covered for you in our study guide. The link to subscribe is below. But for now, let's go over a couple of key concepts that you've gotta know for this category of your exam. You'll likely get some questions about poetry, You'll need to know the different types of poetry and their specific characteristics. Types of poetry include epic, mock epic, syncane, blank verse, free verse, lyric, haiku, limerick, sestina, acrostic, villanelle, and sonnet. Let's take a look at sonnets. A sonnet is known as a love poem with a strict rhyme scheme. There are actually two forms of sonnets. Petrarchan sonnets, also known as Italian sonnets, are the first documented type of sonnet, first appearing in the year 1613. This type of sonnet contains 14 lines in which the last words in the first, fourth, fifth, and eighth lines rhyme, and the last words in the second, third, sixth, and seventh lines have a different rhyme together. The ninth line is called the volta, or turn, in which the tone of the poem shifts. Later well-known poets who adopted this form include William Wordsworth and Robert Browning. You've probably heard of Shakespearean or English sonnets. This form consists of three quatrains and a couplet that follow this rhyme scheme. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. The most famous author of this type of sonnet was William Shakespeare, who numbered many of his sonnets instead of giving them descriptive titles. I mean, who doesn't love Sonnet 18? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Ugh, we love a gorgeous summer day. So Shakespeare is saying you're even lovelier than that? beautiful stuff, right? Another important concept to know is tone. Tone is the author's attitude toward the subject they're writing about. But here's a tip. Tone is not the same as mood. Mood is how the text makes the reader feel. Depending on the type of text, the tone can vary a lot. In a literary piece, it could be arrogant, sentimental, defiant, optimistic, and those are just a few examples. You could be given an excerpt and asked to identify the tone. The question will be straightforward, like, the author's attitude toward the topic is, or simply, what is the tone of this passage? Start by determining if the words in the excerpt have mostly positive or negative connotations. That can help you rule out a wrong answer. And keep your eye out for a distractor choice that's really a mood. Be sure to stick around for the practice questions at the end of this video, because I made sure to include one about tone so you can put these tips into action. I've been trying to have an upbeat, helpful tone in this video. Is it coming through? Let me know in the comments. Great, let's move on to category three. Don't worry, I won't forget category two, I promise. In category three, you'll get questions about, well, writing, speaking, and listening. For writing, you'll need to know the characteristics of clear and coherent writing and how task, purpose, and audience impact writing. For speaking, be familiar with effective presentation delivery and the use of digital tools. And for listening, be ready to answer questions about the components of effective oral communication. I know, there's a lot bundled into this category too, but don't worry, I've got your back. Let's look at a couple of the most important concepts. Let's take a look at a video in our study guide to hear about those three types. Each of the three main types of writing has its own purpose, audience, organization, 
and style choices associated with it. Let's get into each one. Narrative or descriptive writing tells a story or describes a specific person, place, or thing. Descriptive writing can stand alone or be a part of a narrative. Descriptive writing is used to create detailed descriptions and help create the mood or atmosphere. Sensory details are often used and include descriptions of the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and how things feel in the story. Transition words create a sense of time and organize events and the story. Dialogue between characters may be used. Subgenres include short stories, vignettes, letters, memoirs, and poems. Persuasive or argumentative writing seeks to convince the reader to believe the writer's opinion on a topic. Some subgenres include speeches, advertisements, or debates. Informative or expository writing explains a topic or gives general information on a subject. Some subgenres include essays, research reports, and informative pieces written in various organizational styles or brochures. From these three types of writing, we're able to apply writing skills a number of ways, both in and out of the classroom. Those types seem pretty simple, right? Well, they can get a little trickier when you're given an excerpt and asked which type it is, or when you're given a prompt for a writing assignment and asked which type is the most appropriate for a response. So that's why it's important to know those types of writing inside and out. One more key concept to cover in this category, effective presentations. You'll need to teach students how to prepare, create, organize, and deliver a variety of effective presentations. Presentations can help students build confidence, engage in oral communication, and learn to work as individuals or groups toward a final goal. At some point, we've all sat through presentations that were less than effective, am I right? Let's look at some tips that we can use to make sure our students do it right. First, slides on PowerPoint or Google Slides presentations should be limited to essential information and used as a reference or guide for the presentation rather than something that's read directly. That one's a biggie. I used to tell my students, the audience doesn't want to see the back of your head when you're reading off the slide. They want to see your face. Next, align your text to the left. Justifying margins to the left makes the visual aids appear more familiar and more like text the audience is accustomed to reading. Teach students to avoid centered or right justified text unless doing so achieves an expressed purpose. Be sure to use text that is easy to read. Using contrasting colors, avoiding bright or neon colors, and avoiding moving marquee lettering make visual aids more accessible for the audience. Like this. Don't do this. Finally, it's important to limit the title to information the presentation directly covers. A title that's to the point and focused will prepare the audience for the information they're about to receive. And once the presentation is over, it'll help them remember the main argument that was made. Okay, that's it for writing, speaking, and listening. Of course, not completely. I have more speaking to do and you get to listen. On to our last category. Category two, language use and vocabulary, covers things like grammar, syntax, and mechanics, and methods for supporting language acquisition for diverse learners. It also includes the use of reference materials to support language usage. Let's start with that. A student may need to properly spell a word, access a definition, write in a standardized style, or locate a more suitable word for a sentence. In these situations, it's important to choose the most appropriate print or digital reference materials for the job. Here are the most common types of print and digital reference materials you'll need to be familiar with. I'm going to explain one from each category in detail. For explanations of the rest of the materials, along with questions to consider when deciding which to use, check out the 240 study guide. It's loaded with everything you need to rock this category and your whole exam. For print materials, let's take a closer look at style manuals. Now, contrary to what you may believe looking at my outfit, we're not talking about clothing style, but writing style, of course. Your students may use a style manual when they want to write in a uniform style or create citations for a research paper. Here are some to know. You've probably heard of MLA and APA before. As for digital materials, let's talk about grammar checkers for a moment. Your students may use them to check their grammar as they complete a document using the computer's word processor. These are great tools. Technology is awesome, isn't it? But we've got to teach our students to check behind the checker. We need to review suggested changes because sometimes they'll be unnecessary or they may actually be incorrect for your specific context. Okay, I've got one more key concept for you in this category, determining the meaning of words. 
You might be given a passage and asked how students would determine the meaning of an underlined word, or asked to select which phrase has a similar meaning. One way we can determine the meaning of a word is by using context. Even if a choice might sometimes be the meaning of the given word, it has to be the meaning used within the passage. What message is the author trying to get across? It's often related to the main idea of the entire passage. In this sentence, you can use the context of alphabetical order to infer the meaning of supersede as coming before. Another way to determine the meaning of a word is to use syntactic or semantic clues. Think about the placement of the given word. Is it a verb, an adjective? In this sentence, a reader who recognizes that the word ornery is an adjective to describe the author's big brother could infer that ornery means something negative. Be sure to stick around through the practice question portion of this video because I've got one that'll help us nail this skill down. All right, we made it through all three categories, but we're not ready to close the book yet. I've got some practice questions lined up for you that you don't wanna miss. These practice questions will show you how those big concepts we went over can appear on the test. If you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test in the description. After you see how you did on that test, you'll know exactly what you need to study in the guide. Here's a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. Take a look at it. The characteristics of this poem best reflect which type of poetry? Lyric, sonnet, ballad, or free verse? It's an example of a lyric because it's a relatively short poem that expresses strong emotions and contains a rhyme scheme. Let's look at another one from the reading category. This is the one I promised you about tone. This question gives you the text of the poem, The Fisher's Boy, and asks, what is the overall tone Thoreau creates with the details? Irreverent, restrained, thoughtful, or impartial? Remember that the author's tone is their attitude toward what they're writing. The answer is thoughtful. Thoreau has a thoughtful tone toward his writing as he reflects on his life. An example of where we see this is, my life is like a stroll upon the beach. Okay, time to move on. Let's go in the same order that we did earlier in the video. So that means category three is next, writing, speaking, and listening. This question gives us a writing prompt and asks, which of the following writing formats would be the most appropriate choice for a student responding to the above prompt? An essay, letter, blog post, or pamphlet? At first, I thought the answer was an essay, but the quiz feedback feature in the 240 study guide shows me that while the teacher could assess students' ideas in an essay, the prompt specifically asks students to choose an audience, so the best answer is actually a letter. That would be the most logical and engaging form of argumentative writing. Nice, let's tackle one more from this category. Which of the following is the most important goal to accomplish when creating a digital slide presentation? To summarize the main points of the presentation, to create spectacular graphics, to supplement the main points with relevant new information, or to add a quiz at the end of the presentation that reinforces the main ideas? This is the correct answer. Summarizing the main points of the presentation is the best use of the digital slides because it allows the viewer to follow along with the main points while the presenter emphasizes them. Two categories down, one to go. Moving on to language use and vocabulary. Remember when we talked about all those types of reference materials you need to know? Let's see what you've got. A high school student is editing and revising a 10-page paper on the American Revolution. In the course of the paper, the student references five scholarly articles and four books on the subject. The student asks the teacher how to properly cite the sources used. Which of the following print or digital reference tools will be most useful to complete the parenthetical references within the paper and a works cited page at the conclusion of the paper? A digital linguistic guide, printed collegiate dictionary, printed style manual, or digital citation generator? Yep, it's the digital citation generator. It'll help with both parenthetical citations and the works cited page. The student will just enter the information for each reference material, and it'll give them the proper citations. But of course, we need to remind students to check the citations just to be sure. Okay, one question left. Let's see it. We've got a passage, which we need to use to answer this question. Which of the following words best defines the word probity as it is used in the passage? Problems, integrity, corruption, or fame? The answer is integrity. Using context, Bergson's father's second wife was unprincipled, meaning she was a wife without character, and her unprincipled nature warped or twisted the good character that his father had held onto for a lifetime. And that's it, you made it. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, throw us a like. 
there's still plenty more to learn. Did you know that thousands of teachers have used 240 to pass their Praxis exams? If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the Praxis English Language Arts Content Knowledge Exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 Study Guide. It has hours of videos, so you can watch and or listen as you please. It's test aligned, so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions, so you can be sure you're ready. And it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started.